Thank you for joining The Secret Chord, a weekly exploration of music and spirituality. I'm your host, Adam Jacobs. Hi, folks, and welcome to episode 16 of The Secret Chord, featuring the music of the great Jane Sibbery. Jane was actually born uh, Jane Stewart in Toronto, Canada, 1995. And I figured I would tell you a few interesting things about her as a prelude to who she is as an artist and also as a spiritual being. So she chose the name Sibiri from different family members. It was actually the name of her maternal aunt and uncle. And uh, years later, she would explain this choice by saying, quote, that this woman and her husband were the first couple I met where I could feel the love between them, and I held that in front of me as a reference point. So I think that's significant, that she was willing to change her last name and her identity based on the observation of a very close relationship of two people that she knew. Love is a prominent theme in her work, and I would say that as a person, she is somebody who has always sought meaning, but I'll get back to that. So Jane learned piano from the age of four, basically teaching herself and developing her own concepts of notation and structure. At school, she learned conventional music theory and taught herself how to play guitar, basically by working through the music of Leonard Cohen. And just as a side note, there's something about Canadian singer-songwriters. Gordon Lightfoot, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell come to mind, and of course, Leonard Cohen. And Jane is amongst that group as being one of the great singer-songwriters to come out of Canada. She started composing at the age of 17, and although she has a folky kind of element, she's generally compared to people like Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel, and has also a progressive, unusual edge to her sound as well. Now, as I mentioned, Jane is somebody on a search for meaning in her music and in her life. Back in 2006, she actually gave up music altogether. She closed her office. She changed her name to Isa, which apparently is a variant of Isaiah. And then she auctioned and sold nearly all of her possessions on eBay, including her Toronto home and all of her instruments, except for one guitar that she kept. And at that time, she told the Globe and Mail that she had kept very few precious possessions, including her Miles Davis CDs. And I can relate to that. <laughs> Miles, Miles is a necessity. Um, but despite that, she gave up everything to find an even deeper meaning than the music that she had performed for so many years. She is somebody that possesses both depth and humor at the exact same time sometimes. Um, and it's an unusual combination Her first hit was off of an album called No Borders Here, and the track was called Mimi on the Beach. It's a seven and a half minute art rock single, which happens to be hilarious if you listen to it, and also musically fascinating. The opening line is, I scanned the horizon for you, Mimi. And it's just, it's this funny, upbeat, full of life tune with these unusual time signatures and unusual instrumentation. It's a lot of fun and a very cool song. There's another song she has called The Lobby, which I think is funny also. And the chorus there is, quote, take off that foolish hat, put down the chair. What kind of songs have lyrics like that? It's just very, very out of the box. At the same time, she has lyrics like she has in a song called Sail Across the Water, which are the following. Love is frozen, frozen in the figure they just pulled from the subway grate. Love is burning, burning with the anger that we all feel against which we kneel. Our faces pressed into the lap of loneliness. Come on, love, will you sail across the water and lay your wisdom down? And love, will you sail across the water and tell us what you found? And love, will you sail across the water and hold us when we drown? Whew, that's heavy. It's heavy, interesting, pleading. That's sort of a hallmark of her style also. So funny, upbeat, bright on the one hand, and then very reflective on the other. Together, it's a very powerful and unusual combination. So I see her 
essentially merrily strolling through life and enjoying it while taking long, deep pauses to think about other things. So the song I'd like to talk about today is called Calling All Angels. It was released in 1991 and it's been described as art pop or dream pop. It was also featured in an emotional scene in the film Pay It Forward back in 2000 with Kevin Spacey and Helen Hunt. And it beautifully features a duet with her fellow Canadian, Katie Lang. Let's let the song speak for itself. And then as always, we'll discuss afterwards. This is Calling All Angels by the great Jane Sibbery. Santa Maria, Santa Teresa, Santa Anna, Santa Susanna, Santa Cecilia, Santa Capilia, Santa Dominica, Mary Angelica, Fader Ashes, Fader Pieter, Julianus, Petronella, Santa, Santa, Spirit of Maria, Nova Zarez. upon the steps and the baby cries high above you can hear the church bell start to ring and as the heaviness oh the heaviness the body settles in somewhere you can hear a mother sing then it's one foot then the other Step out on the road Step out on the road How much weight, how much Then it's how long and how far and how many times Oh, before it's too late Gone all angels, but 
That is just a gorgeous piece of music. So Jane once said, I've never heard anyone put into words why music is such a powerful thing. For a lot of people, music is like a friend to them. I feel that way. I feel each of these tunes that we profile is like a, it's like a friend. It's like an old friend, something that you really care about. And no, no one ever has put into words why music is such a powerful thing. It doesn't make sense. This tune is unusual. And here's how I would describe it. It's a cross between sacred music, listen to the strings, the low cello against the angelic vocals of Katie Lang and Jane Sibbery. And it also has this prairie song of the Canadian West. Katie is from Alberta and she has a long career in, I guess, what you would call cowboy music. But you can hear both at the same time. And the combination is striking and it's also extremely effective. It's a folk tune. It's also a sacred tune. The lyrics are, should be obvious to anyone, extremely profound and uh, target rich in terms of our ability to discuss all these different facets that she brings up. And I don't know if we'll have time to hit all of it, but let's start. Towards the opening, she says, and as the heaviness, oh, the heaviness of the body settles in, then it's one foot and the other as you step out on the road, Step out on the road. How much weight? How much? And then it's how long and how far and how many times? Oh, before it's too late. Hmm. That's deep. So yeah, the body provides heaviness in contradistinction to the soul. And as we might say, far from clarifying things through the senses. The body is actually what's blocking our perception of the ultimate reality. One of the most popular TED Talks ever was called My Stroke of Insight by Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. Go check it out if you never have. It's an astounding story. In a nutshell, she had a stroke that shut off the left part of her brain only, allowing her to experience the world solely through her right brain. She happens to be a brain researcher as well. So this is something that she could self-study as it was happening. And what she discovered and the way she describes it is profoundly spiritual sounding. She was having what I would describe as an unbridled spiritual experience of the world. And it was only when the left brain kicked back in, I mean, that saved her life, practically speaking, but it also ended this transcendent experience that she was having. So the brain, the body is a filter that is blocking the true ultimate nature of things. And as such, the way she describes it, the heaviness carrying the body along and you schlep one foot into the other, you're out on the road carrying it along. And then the question she asks, how long and how far and how many times? Well, isn't that the question? How far down the road will we get? Some people make it short distance, some more, some a really long way. But before it's too late, right, there's an end point to that journey for everybody. But that's really what this world is for. This world is a world of becoming. The next world is a world of being, experiencing all that you've done and that you've built, not going anywhere, but arriving someplace. So Jane in this song appeals to angels to help her along the way. And although in my tradition, we wouldn't appeal directly to angels, not that we don't accept their existence, we would appeal to, to God directly. I understand where she's coming from, that we all need someone along the road with us. It's very hard and very lonely to do it by yourself. And there's a quote from a spiritual thinker named Ram Das that I like, and he says, 
essentially we're all just walking each other home. That's how he describes life. Out on the road, doing it together. We're all in the same boat, on the same journey. She goes on to say, And every day that you gaze upon the sunset with such love and intensity, it's almost as if you could only crack the code and then you'd finally understand what this all means. But if you could, do you think you would trade in all the pain and suffering? Well, but then you'd miss the beauty of the light upon this earth and the sweetness of the leaving. I can't emphasize strongly enough the profundity of what she is, she has written and performed in such a beautiful style. Each one of these things could be taken apart and, and be an hour discussion. But yeah, sunset. Why is a sunset important? Who cares? The sun goes down each and every day. So it makes some nice colors right at the end before it goes down below the horizon. Why is that significant? Why, do, when you stand there and look at it, do you feel, my gosh, this is profound. Something important is happening. How could it possibly produce that feeling in you? There's a, a scene in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which I love, where Richard Dreyfus is trying to understand his desire to go and find this mountain, which has become his obsession. And he's looking at a pile of mashed potatoes that he's sculpting to look like this mountain. And he looks at it and he says, this means something, though we didn't know exactly what. But don't we all want to know that? Don't we all want to crack the code that she's talking about and understand what this all means? We get up day in and day out and we do our stuff and things happen. Some of them make sense. Many of them don't. What a strange world we live in. And somehow there are moments like a sunset, we look at it and we know something much more grand is afoot. We know it, but then it goes away and we continue on our merry way without processing often, but we really should take the time and think about it. So how about you? Would you trade the beauty and the light that she talks about not to have the pain and suffering that she mentions? I think most people would take it. It's a fair trade. They say that no pain, no gain. And this world certainly has its share of pains. The art that people produce, like this tune and many others and other kinds of art, are an attempt to make sense of things, to crack the code, and as she says, finally understand what this all means. I think it's a remarkable line, the last one she says, but oh, then you'd miss the beauty of the light upon this earth and the sweetness of the leaving. What does she mean? What sweetness? Sweetness of leaving this earth? That's what it sounds like to me. And I recalled an idea that in the book of Genesis, every day it says God saw what he had done and it was good. And then suddenly on the sixth day, it says God saw all that he had done and it was very good. And the biblical commentators jump all over that and they say, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean very good? What's the very and a very paradoxical counterintuitive answer is given that the very good is referring to the day of death itself. That if it's true that there is an infinite being who created all and that that being is good, then it must follow that every aspect of creation is equally good, even that, even the leaving. And how much more pleasant might life be if we could look at it that way? That yes, there is wondrous beauty of light upon this earth, and then even beyond this earth, once we leave it, there's even more. I think that's a healthy, satisfying, and reassuring way to live one's life. I thank you, as always, for sharing this song and these ideas with me. I want to mention that The Secret Chord has now a Patreon account. And if you're interested in being a sponsor, you can find it on Patreon under The Secret Chord. And please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and or our SoundCloud account or any other place where podcasts can be found. It's been a pleasure speaking with you as always, and I look forward to speaking to you again next week. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Thank you for listening. If you would like to find more content like this, as well as information about live programming, visit us at www.hny.com. That's www.aishny.com.